Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is the Missouri Open Door Workshop. Um, I'm just letting people in the room as we talk here. And I've tried to mute, I've turned my speakers off so you can't hear that annoying bell. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just really kind of get us started. So hi, I'm Julie Reynolds and I'm with the University of Missouri, Kansas City's Institute for Human Development. Um, and we are um, part of the No Wrong Door Grant for Missouri, who sponsors this, uh, this monthly open door workshop. Um, we have David Baker, who's going to be talking to us in just a moment from Missouri Institute of Technology. And I think his, his uh, trusty uh, person scout is on here somewhere too. So glad you guys could all make it. I'm glad you found us since we are um, off, our, off our time for the month. We're, we're a week early to account for the holiday. So we're glad you're here. I'm going to do, I'm going to admit to you that I am um, shamelessly turned to a video for you today for my part because David had so much cool stuff and I thought it was a good video. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in and get started. If you haven't yet put um, in the chat who you are and who you're with, please go ahead and do so. Okay, so as I said, we're here around the Missouri No Wrong Door. Um, and as we talk about when we're here, it's really how we transform the way people are able to access services in Missouri. And that's all people and how they access um, both paid services and non-paid services and supports. And then how we can assist in caregivers and, and people who are supporting other people um, to get really good information and make good decisions about what kind of supports they need. And again, it's across the whole lifespan of, of all people and how we can improve that, that entry into any kind of a system. So as you know, I love to do a week, a monthly uh, shameless product plug, and you'll be hearing this for a while. So we have scheduled a date um, for the uh, Life Course Nexus, which is our national uh, Life Course Network, um, for our Showcase 2023, which is a, we call it a showcase, it is not a conference, because really what we do is we showcase what you and everyone else in the field has been doing over the past year or so with a life course. So we have various tracks around everything from, from aging, disabilities, young children, everything, you know, just to really kind of, you know, support the, the life course network and the use it's using the tools, it's the philosophy, all of that. So we do have early bird registration open right now, um, as you can see. And when I am done speaking and David starts to talk, I will drop um, I will drop the link to registration in there. So that's open till January 3rd. Um, we are, you are able to register and just ask to pay, have the invoice on it so you don't have to pay immediately. So, you know, it will be in Kansas City, Missouri at the Westin. Um, it is probably one of my favorite things I get to do every year. I always tell people that after we've been going for six years, maybe seven now, I don't know, I lose track. Um, that it's just a great day to great, great couple days to re-energize and re, really reinvigorate what you're doing to support people um, throughout Missouri. So please, please think about joining us. Uh, it is all going to be in person this year. We're not going to have a virtual option as we did last year. So just keep that in mind. And again, I'll put registration link in the um, in the chat when I get done speaking. So I want to talk a minute about Medicare and Missouri claim, just some fun facts. So um, if you don't know this, Medicare is a federal insurance program. Um, and it's for people 65 and older, but it's also for people under 65 who have certain disabilities. So if you're working with anybody that you feel like, you know, you may want to know if they are eligible for Medicaid or if there's something in or Medicare that it can assist them, um, they can be on Medicaid and still have Medicare. So they can be duly eligible for both, which helps them get, you know, really additional insurance benefits. So kind of keep that in mind. And if you don't know, if you want have questions, we've got Missouri claim in here. Oh, and I did state that it is the largest health insurer in the United States. So that's very pretty, really, pretty cool, really, um, continuing to grow. But Missouri claim is out there um, and they are really there to answer any questions you have about Medicare, everything from is this, could this person be eligible? How do I find out to, you know, this person's having, we think there's been Medicare fraud from somebody we're working with and everything in between. So they just came off uh, the open enrollment period. Um, I talked to someone from Claim earlier today and they said they had more calls in that period 
um, than they've ever had. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's all open enrollment and they'll know more about that soon, but just really keep that in mind that that is out there. Also, another did you know, because I felt like doing graphics today, there's a lot of organizations out there that are partnering with Missouri Claim to do counseling and support around Medicare. I, I'll put this link again in my in the chat when I'm done, but they really do. If you want to talk with someone locally, there's places all across the state and every region that can help support that and help do, do counseling either virtually or in person around Medicare. So there's a couple of different ways to contact them in addition to those 800 numbers and that, that website. All righty, I'm gonna roll right into um, social isolation. And what I did today, it, it really wasn't because I was trying to pop out, but I just wanted to, I was trying to think of somebody that could come in and talk about social isolation and how it affected them and how it affected their mental health and their family. So the video I'm gonna show you is about seven minutes long. Um, it's a woman named Amy who works for the National Association for Mental Illness here in Missouri, the Missouri chapter. Um, and this was actually back during COVID. So we're going to ignore the fact that their, their lead slide says something about COVID because we all just wanna kind of move on. But it was really telling when I, when I watched it several times about really how she used the tools She's got some pictures of the tools up there. It's, they're kind of hard to see. And the point isn't really to see what she wrote, but just for her to talk about really what she did and, and, and how she was able to, to work her way through her social isolation. Um, so this was my daughter. Um, I've used these materials with her before um, in preparing for her IEP meetings um, because she goes to her IEP meetings so that she's going in there knowing what she wants, what she doesn't want. Um, we were both kind of having um, some challenges. Just with feeling depressed and a lot of anxiety with the COVID-19 situation. Um, so we use these materials to kind of think about what does it look like? Um, this one is Olivia, my daughter saying, what does it look like when she's happy? What does it look like when she's unhappy? Um, just to kind of get an idea of, you know, what am I feeling like? So when she's happy, she wants to go outside, she laughs, um, she wants to spend time with others. When she's not happy, she put that she's hasty, tense, isolated, rude, and terse. Um, so this was just kind of to get like a feeling of how do I know if I'm not doing okay? Um, you can go on to the next one. This one was mine. So I put, what am I like when I'm calm and happy? Um, I put that I was productive, creative. I look forward to each day. I feel grateful. I have a sense of humor and I tend to bounce back from things. Um, under the what don't I want, I just wrote down what do I look like? when I'm anxious, um, depressed, or afraid. And and I get really grouchy, I cry a lot. I feel very down um, for myself personally because I do live with a mental health um, challenge. I have thoughts of death um, sometimes and, and I have no motivation. So just kind of an, an idea of knowing yourself. Um, you can go to the next one. This was my star. Um, I put myself in the center and how I was gonna manage my mood and my anxiety level during COVID-19. And I tried to use all of those pie wedges. Um, and I like doing this exercise because um, I can feel really afraid and alone. And then I do something like this and it reminds me of what I know. It reminds me of the skills that I have and all of the different areas of my life where I can get support. So usually after filling out one of these forms, I feel um, up to the task, if that makes sense. So I, I listed everything I could do under technology, like, like limiting my consumption of the news, um, tailoring my social media feed, um, using you know technology to connect with my family and my friends, um, other things that help me like crafting um, exercise. Uh, my daughter and I like to play Just Dance on the Wii. Um, it makes us both feel a lot better. We laugh, we move. It's a good time for both of us. Um, I listed all my personal strengths and assets. Um, 
relationships that I have with my daughter and with my extended family and the other supports that I have. And again, I found it very helpful. I don't know, do I have one more or is this the end? Okay, and this was my daughter. She drew a happy face in the star and she wrote down, you know, she has some calming games that she does when she's stressed that are pretty much kind of like shapes and music. And she has one that's like a mandala kind of drawing that she can put her finger on and it draws patterns and it'll make her feel really, really calm. Um, she has some shows, animated shows that she likes to watch on TV that are um, funny. So if she's not feeling happy, they make her laugh. Um, she put movies down. She loves to play DJ and um, play all different kinds of music. She has all these playlists set up on YouTube that she'll play for us. And then she put her personal strengths and assets. So like draw, create, read, design, um, play on her computer. I don't know what what some of those things are. <laughs> They're things that she understands. She wrote down her relationships and then she put the services she could use like like online therapy services. And then she chats online with her friends. Um, sometimes she'll just tell me, I, I need to call. She has a friend named Maddie. She'll say, I need to Skype with Maddie, mom. I'm not feeling very positive right now. Um, so again, I felt that this was helpful. Um, she was kind of nervous about being on this call, um, but I asked her, you know, what did doing this feel like for you? And she just said that it was a good way to think about all of the different things she could do to feel better. Um, so thank you guys. I thought that was interesting. A couple of things I think that struck me as she was talking was one, how open she was about some of her struggles, which I always think is great when people can talk about that. But then also how they really use the trajectory in a very specific way to say, this is the stuff that makes me happy and this is the stuff that irritates me. And I found when I was looking at that and listening to it, that those are all the things that probably irritate all of us. But you know, writing them down on paper and then trying to avoid the things you want to stay away from and kind of focusing on those happier things is, is really one way to, to do that. And I think you know, the way she used the star is very cool because there's ways you can really talk about and think about when you feel socially isolated or depressed, what are some of the things that I can do um, and what are the things I already have? So so it's kind of like you had a substitute teacher today and got a video. So I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to talk to us about the technology to reduce social isolation. So go forth, David. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Julie, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there were a couple of things as I was watching the video of, of Amy and Olivia, um, a couple of things that really kind of uh, got me excited. The first one is how well the, the, the star worked in helping them work through some of the scenarios and some of the issues that they faced. But I especially love the fact that there were um, some items listed up there in the upper left hand corner where the uh, section for technology is. And there, I caught myself making some mental suggestions to them um, telepathically uh, as uh, for some ideas for technology that I actually have in the presentation that uh, I thought that was kind of funny that, um, but it does, it makes a really nice, um, kind of laying the groundwork, having the framework tool that uh, that includes technology, which is obviously what I want to kind of focus in on today. Um, so, Julie, if we move to the next slide. So we all are very well aware of the, the issue of social isolation. It kind of came screaming home to us during the pandemic. And there was a lot of focus on it. And I if I remember correctly, the very first mod presentation we did was on social isolation. So it seemed like it was good to return to it for two reasons that jumped out to me. The first one is the fact that there's a Pew Research study that came out in 2018. And at that point in time, they talked about the fact that at any given point in time, one in 10 individuals is experiencing social isolation. And then we hit the pandemic. So we all know that social isolation has been an issue um, and it's going to continue to be an issue. And as we approach the holidays and as we approach winter, it becomes even greater uh, in terms of the number of individuals that are impacted by it. It's, a, it's kind of a slightly strange topic in a way because it, in and of itself, social isolation is not necessarily bad. Uh, most of us at some point in our life crave the solitude and occasionally 
occasionally being alone. We find it relaxing. We find it rejuvenating. We find it uh, meditative in a lot of respects. So, but when we talk about social isolation, we're typically referring to solitude that is unwarranted, unwanted, or unhealthy. So kind of our working definition is that it's an objective lack of social relationships or infrequency. There are a variety of things that, oh, you could move it back to that slide there, Julie. There are a number of things um, that can cause social isolation. And if you go out there and do a little research, there's, there's quite a list, but I thought these are probably the most common experiences or reasons that people um, experience social isolation. So the loss of a loved one. Um, if an individual has mental health issues like anxiety or depression, which we saw uh, as being um, things that Olivia and Amy had highlighted. If they're in a remote location where they're separated from family and friends, or if they've recently uh, experience unemployment, these are prime causes of social isolation. So moving to the next slide, um, there are, it, it, so it gets a little hard sometimes to decide whether or not somebody is actually experiencing social isolation that is unhealthy, or maybe that's kind of where they want to be at that point in time. But there are a number of warning signs out there. We're not going to spend a lot of time going through these. But I thought that the two that I have highlighted there of the five or so that are on the list um, might be our biggest clues with the folks that we work with. You know, if somebody's feeling distressed during a period of solitude, maybe they're separated from family and friends for the holidays, those types of scenarios, or if somebody is choosing to spend a large amount of time alone or with extremely limited contact with others. I think as we go about our jobs interacting with people, these are things that might leap out to us as warning signs. So if we move on to the next slide, even though they're not sure why this is, it is a pretty well-established fact that there is a num there are a number of health issues that are affected or can be caused or exasperated by feelings of social isolation. So things like sleeplessness, um, reduction in immune function, higher anxiety, greater amounts of um, depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, and even things like poor cardiovascular health and decreased cognitive function. They're not 100% sure why this happens, but there, like I said, is incredible um, information out there and data linking these two things together. For instance, there's a 40% increase in the risk of dementia uh, among people that are experiencing social isolation. I've also seen the uh, health, negative health consequences of social isolation referred to as being the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So social isolation is more than just being isolated, it also is gonna affect somebody's health if they, if they experience it for too much time or in an unhealthy manner. So moving on to the next slide. So just a quick disclaimer, you know, individuals who are suffering from the effects of social isolation should always be mindful of their symptoms and wherever possible, seek help from experts if these symptoms continue to persist or become severe. Um, we're gonna talk about technology, that's not gonna be a cure. There are other things that somebody needs to make sure that they attend to if they're experiencing um, the effects of social isolation. So our next slide. So one of the things that I've noticed um, as I do more research in the area of uh, how we can use technology for mental health issues, for executive function issues, some of the more, some of the intellectual and cognitive things um, that we all experience. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered as time goes on is there's usually two parts to this conversation. The first part of it is that there need to be strategies in place and one of the things that comes through very clearly in a lot of the literature about um, social isolation is the idea that it's important to have a strategy. If you are experiencing social isolation, they encourage you to engage in relaxing activities, to not you know, cause yourself to become more anxious or more depressed or to just get on that uh, mental roller coaster of thinking the same thoughts over and over again, to follow a routine, to maintain healthy habits, to stay connected with family and friends and stay informed. And informed sometimes, um, it seems ironic because sometimes it's the, uh, 
you know, all the information that's happening, all the things that are happening in the world that cause us to, uh, you know, separate ourselves from the world. Um, so not just news, but stay informed with what's going on in your community, your clubs, organizations, those types of things. Um, th these strategies actually kind of came home to me because my mother lives by herself. And if there is a person on the face of the earth that maintains healthy habits, stays connected and follows a routine and enjoys relaxing activities, it is my mother, which probably explains why it is that she, even though she lives alone uh, in Iowa, in rural Iowa, she has not um, expressed uh, social isolation um, at all in her 90 years on this on this planet. All right, so let's move in now to the role of technology. So if we move on to the next slide again. So there are these self-care strategies that we should have in place. And on top of that, we can talk about technology. So it's a supplement to those self-care strategies. So it's also most effective when other symptoms are under control. So if I'm somebody um, that maybe has some underlying mental health issues, make sure those are under control and the technology can be more effective as a result. It's a little hard to kind of categorize or think about technology solutions. Um, for social isolation. And uh, some of the research that I did um, kind of encouraged thinking about it around barriers that an individual encounters as a result of their social isolation. So if I'm somebody that has anxiety um, or I'm experiencing anxiety, then maybe I'm looking for technology tools that will be soothers and comforters for me. If I experience agitation, things that distract me or disruptors to the thoughts, the negative thoughts that I might be having. Um, safety and monitoring types of tools if I am experiencing risky behavior. If I just want some therapeutic tools, we have mood trackers and screeners if it's a more therapeutic type of um, uh, barrier that I'm encountering. And so that's kind of a, just a way of looking at what we want for different situations as we kind of try to decide what technology is available out there. All right, so let's get into some technology. And we're going to talk with, uh, talk, let's kind of start with, um, oh gosh, some things that would be maybe a little bit more useful if I'm experiencing um, so sort of um, mood trackers and screeners and um, distractors, and just a couple of things thrown together here, or a couple of those barriers um, thrown together here. A lot of the devices that are out there work around this idea of mindfulness, which we've all heard a lot about in the last decade or so. And that's the whole idea of helping improve our mental state by focusing on one's awareness uh, on the present while calmly and gently uh, acknowledging and accepting our feelings and our thoughts and our sensations um, in life. So that's kind of a, you know, a lot of different ways you can define it. That's one of the ways that I define this whole idea of mindfulness. And so a lot of these tools are kind of built around that idea. And the first thing we're looking at here on the screen is a device called the Spire. And this is, um, there's a website called Spire Store, and it might be worth investigating a little bit because there are a lot of other interesting devices that these folks have come out with. And this is a little pendant that clips to the belt. And the idea behind it is to measure the, um, measure your breath. So it is sensing the expansion and the contraction of the torso. It um, pairs up with an app available both in the iOS and the Android um, environment. And so it's measuring your breathing patterns, it tracks your sleep. And as a result of that, if I become tense or erratic uh, in my behavior, it'll give me a gentle notification to, and suggest some activities to help me um, sort of begin to wind down, be a little less anxious. Um, these can be breathing visualization exercises. There's some guided meditations in here. And so it's a very relatively inexpensive tracker that just kind of focuses on helping me to stay calm. It's around $150, $175 if I remember. Very easy to use, pretty straightforward. The next slide here is gonna look a little futuristic, but I'm beginning to think that we are going to start seeing more and more of these types of devices out there. And this is called the Muse 2, actually, uh, brain sensing device. And so it's a headband and uh, it measures EEG. And I'm so glad that they start referring to this as EEG because it actually stands for electro in something graphing. There's literally 21 letters in the, um, in the word. So they just refer to it as EEG. And so it's measuring whether I am calm or my brain is active. 
and then it translates that data into weather sounds, which I thought was interesting. So if I am calm, I will hear peaceful weather sounds. If my mind wanders, then the sound of the weather uh, is going to intensify and it's going to guide me back to a calm state. So that just seems, it seems a little um, science fiction-y in a lot of respects, but I kind of like that simple idea of it's able to kind of sense my brain waves and give me some guidance um, subtly uh, based on around weather sounds to help me understand kind of where I'm at and help me get back to where I want to be. Moving on to the next slide, we'll get away from some of the higher tech devices and uh, look at a couple of low tech devices here. And the first one is calm wear clothing which uh, I had never heard of these folks until I was putting some stuff together for this presentation. But we have utilized some of these ideas um, around compression clothing uh, for individuals, kids in particular that have a, um, anxiety or autism. And now this is all being expanded into the adult environment as well. So a calm wear clothing has a line of clothing that's all compression clothing. And the idea behind it is to help calm my sensory system. They also have bed linens available. So it can be t-shirts, it can be um, you know dress shirts, they have a variety of different clothing objects that are available out there. And it's very low tech, but the idea is to kind of help keep me mindful, keep me relaxed, Relax, provide me with some calm sensory um, stimulus for my system to kind of um, overcome some of the issues that I might be experiencing. Even more low tech is our next item, uh, which are is this whole idea of coloring, mindfulness coloring. And I think we've kind of seen this um, explode a little bit over the last few years, especially during the pandemic. And um, in kind of getting a little more familiar with this. I was uh, on the Mayo Clinic's website and they have a whole section on the health benefits of mindfulness coloring. So the types of things that it can be help, help improve uh, an individual's um, condition can be things like relieving stress. It helps to calm the brain. It detaches you from things that are going on in your environment. Uh, it can relax the body and even sleep and uh, less fatigue are things that people experience by just taking the time to um, non-judgmentally um, spend time doing something that we all did as kids that still has a lot of value in this day and age. And um, the, some of the information in the Mayo Clinic's uh, article on this, it talked about how it, they have, it's decreased body aches, reduced heart rate, uh, respiration has been better, and people's feelings of anxiety and depression have um, minimized as well, simply through taking the time to kind of step aside, enjoy this activity, and um, very low-tech uh, type of option that's available. Moving on to the next slide, we're going to kind of talk about some um, ideas here that are intended to improve sleep. Sleep is something that often gets disrupted when people are experiencing social isolation. And these are all standalone devices, all relatively, well, the one on the left and the one on the right are pretty inexpensive. They're between 30 and $50, depending on which version of this technology you get. The one on the left is called the Electrofan White Noise Sound Machine. So white noise, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, uh, it's used to mask irritating noises to make, to make sleep and focus better for individuals. And it takes wave frequencies um, and uh, distributes them evenly. And so they fall upon the human ear differently. Um, and so uh, it's, it's actually, if you wanna go down a rabbit hole, read up on this whole idea of white noise, it's pretty fascinating um, kind of how it all works. So um, on the left, there's the Electrofan, and it's by a company called Electrofan, and they make some other versions as well of this idea, even have some that are designed just for kids. Um, and so this is the one that I think was around $30, and it has a variety of white noises um, that, are, uh, that you can turn on. They can be set on a timer to help you fall asleep, those types of things. They also have what is, is called pink noise, which is another approach to this idea, which kind of think about a waterfall that would be kind of a pink noise sound, and then brown noise, which would be kind of resembling rain. Um, so different types of using sound waves, again, to back to, to uh, prevent irritating environmental noises, to help increase somebody's uh, sleep, uh, those types of things. On the right is the Dream Egg, very similar to the Electrofan. 
Um, but what it uses is not so much white noise as soothing sounds. And so ocean sounds, crickets, those um, wind in the, in the trees, those types of sounds, which again, um, can be masking. They can also be pleasant. They can help reduce anxiety. And in the middle there, um, and these are kind of expensive, I'll confess. These are the, the boys nose noise masking sleep buds. Um, but they can be super great uh, for, again, blocking things out, um, helping somebody be able to um, uh, kind of focus a little more strongly. And then, you know, couple those with music. Music can be uh, super great in terms of helping people when they're experiencing social isolation as well. Um, moving on to the next slide, a little bit, another one of the trackers, one of the things that we see um, time and time again, um, these have been emerging in the assistive technology and the technology world um, over the years. And these are all sorts of these wearable devices. And this is called the Dream On Sleep Aid. Again, it's around the idea of helping somebody uh, sleep better uh, and uh, be less fatigued as a result. And so I can wear this on my wrist or I can wear it on my ankle. And it uses these tactile pulses that can automatically shut off after a certain amount of time. Um, they're kind of on 15 minute increments. And so these tactile pulses are actually just gentle pulses. Um, the idea is that they'll help, they're using touch to help you relax um, as a result. So uh, the idea here is a technique called brainwave entertainment and these stimuli then are going to um, create a state of calmness, very subtle, very gentle, um, but there is, a, again, a, all sorts of research out there about the effects of touch as a way of calming somebody, helping them sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would pair this with an app, and then I can track this information as well um, so that I can get a, a sense on um, how well I'm sleeping. So this is from a company called sleepgadgets.com. Sleep is, we all know, incredibly important. There are a lot of individuals that, that have issues around sleep. It's its own category of health issues. It's something that people with uh, social, that are experiencing social isolation struggle with. And so if you want to see some of the other types of technology that are um, out there through this company for these types of things, I would certainly go to sleepgadgets.com. There's all sorts of, um, there's even smart bedding out there, which I didn't even realize, smart mattresses, um, some anti-snoring devices, uh, head Phones. They have a lot of different interesting devices, and it's a, another good rabbit hole to go down. Moving on to our next slide, and this is um, we've we've probably all encountered these. Um, they are readily available now. It used to be they were kind of a specialty item, and that's weighted blankets. Most of the big box stores, you can find a, a weighted blanket for adults, and other types of weighted weighted throws, all sorts of different types of this idea. Um, and the whole idea here is that these weighted blankets provide deep touch pressure to help ang reduce anxiety and sleep issues. Very simple, relatively inexpensive, um, but it uh, can, can just kind of put your system into a rest mode and thus reducing the various symptoms of anxi anxiety and in increasing sleep. Again, this is the type of thing, you know, sometimes we look at, at least I do, I look at some of these things and I'm a little bit skeptical, go in and do the research. Again, Mayo Clinic has some really nice information on weighted blankets. Um, and so they're increasingly beginning to be scientifically validated if you're somebody that really um, wants that type of information as you're exploring your options. All right, so let's go from sleep um, and, and a nice blanket to how to wake up or how to go to sleep better. And this is called the Philips Smart Sleep Light. And so it uses, um, it kind of senses, there's a couple of versions of this. Um, there's one that has what they call AmbiTrack sensors in it. And so it's going to monitor room temperatures and the noise and the lighting for, via the app you pair it up with. And it's going to adjust the light as a result. And so these lights are designed to um, help wake you up in the morning by softly increasing the amount of light so you wake up more gently. And then on the flip side, if you're trying to fall asleep, it kind of does a sunset uh, type of appearance and that light then fades down to help you then be able to go to sleep. There's some alarms, there's a number of ways you can personalize these um, to adjust the sounds, the alarms, the intensity of the light. 
but again, um, it seems a little ironic to use light to help you sleep since usually we sleep in the dark, but the whole idea is to more gently bring somebody down to a sleep state or more gently bring them out of a sleep state, which will improve sleep, which is something we all can probably benefit from. <clears throat> All right, so I have another thing here in sleep, and this is one we could have done an entire session just around these solutions, but there are a ton of app-based solutions out there related to sleep, which kind of underscores a little bit of how big of an issue this is for individuals. And at the very end, I actually have a, um, um, a website that I wanna to refer to people for greater information about all these app-based solutions because it can become super overwhelming super quick. So the first one there is um, Aura and it's a mindfulness and sleep app. And so it has essentially a whole bunch of tools in it to help me um, with mindfulness. So I could use it throughout the day. I can also use it in the evening to help me sleep. So it's got breathing exercises. It's got um, relaxing sounds that are built into it. Uh, it even has some ASMR um, types of things for you Bob Ross folks in the audience today. Um, I can also have access to some coaching therapy. So it's a very, um, I believe it's free to get started. And then there are some buy-ins that you can do, but it has a lot of different tools that are designed to help me become more mindful, to improve my sleep, to reduce my anxiety, to put me in a better mood. Um, a free option for all of you that use Apple products out there is Apple Bedtime. Um, this gets a little bit overlooked, I think, and it's going to be in your clock setting uh, in, on your app that's already built into the uh, most of the devices. And so I can set reminders to help me sleep. So that goes back to what we said earlier about part of the strategy is having a regular schedule. So I want to make sure I get to bed at a certain time, get up at a certain time, and I can use the Apple Bedtime app to be able to do this. And then it has a variety of sounds, again, to pull me gently out of sleep or to um, soothe me into a good sleep. Um, Calm uh, is... Uh, again, it's another app is very popular. They actually do a lot of advertising of this and it's a meditation sleep uh, encourages to encourages you to move a uh, number of tools that are built in there. And um, so uh, just to, to give you another option. And then there are a variety of white noise apps out there as well. So you don't need to go out and buy a machine. You might be able to download a free app and have those same positive impacts by using white noise to block out irritating sounds, help you sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is one called TM Soft White Noise. And um, I've actually played around with that one quite a bit. And um, it has a lot of different options and um, uh, different versions of white noise as, plus, as, as well as the brown noise and the pink noise. All right, so let's move on to some mood and emotional regulation options out there. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about, you know, early on the very first version of, of this, we introduced you to the companion pets and we did that whole project. Um, and I just wanted to share, there were a number of comments when we did the robotic pet project. And one comment that leapt out at me as I was putting this together, they kind of underscored the, the positive results of using these robotic support animals was a woman who participated in our project and she wrote a comment that said, when I get up, it makes me, it makes a sound and it reminds me that I'm not alone. So already she, her day was um, improved because she didn't feel like she was alone and she was using one of these robotic pets. The data is beginning to show the positive effects of reducing stress, anxiety, depression, loneliness through the use of these robotic support animals. There's lots of folks that can benefit from these because maybe there's a, uh, they can't take care of a pet. They have some uh, restrictions on having a pet in their, their housing situation. On the right hand side is a new one that's come out. It's a little bit more realistic. The only version that they have, I believe right now is this dog. Um, it's a little more interactive in terms of my being able to speak to it and it responds and it's called the Tombot. And um, they had, a, it was a startup campaign. They sold out of the first version. They're now taking um, uh, orders for another round of these that they're gonna uh, manufacture here and put out. So uh, roughly the same, um, It's just it just has a few things that make it just a little bit more interesting and a little bit more interactive. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, again, not gonna spend a lot of time on these. There are a lot of app-based solutions around mood and emotional regulation. And centered, um, I put it on the slide, I was doing uh, some double checking of my material yesterday, 
Um, it's been out there for a long time. It's uh, got a number of tools in it. Um, I think they may be undergoing some kind of change as a company, but it's still one that often gets recommended um, for the variety of, of things that I can do to set goals, to make sure that I have healthy habits, to check in, to um, do some exercises around my, my feelings, my mood, my emotions, et cetera, et cetera. The one in the middle, Mind Chef, Mind Shift CBT is um, free. It comes out of an organization called Anxiety Canada, and they put this together. And it does just about everything but sliced bread um, in terms of the variety of tools. If you're somebody that experiences anxiety, um, you're really concerned about making sure emotionally you stay stable, that your moods are positive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera um, then this might be something to investigate. Um, it helps, it provides me with some, um, some ways of thinking. Uh, if I get on, it helps me stay grounded. Uh, if I have experiences, um, there's what they refer to as a catastrophe scale in there to help me mindfully understand, you know, am I overreacting to a situation? I can do some journaling in, in this app. Um, just a lot of tools that are all designed to kind of track where I'm at and, and change the direction softly for me if I am going sort of in the wrong way. Uh, WhatsApp, uh, or I'm sorry, see, I just made the mistake that I did when I was searching for this. There's another one out there that I wish would change its name. It's called What's Up. I get it mixed up with WhatsApp all the time, which is a completely different type of app, but it too has a number of nice, it's free. There's a number of nice little tools in there to help me be able to um, interact and, and think things through and improve my uh, feelings and make changes to my behavior that can put myself in a better frame of mind um, just simply by using this free app. All right, so the next slide here, we're going to talk a little about light therapy lamps, and these have been around um, on and off over the year, or well, for a number of years. And just as a side note here, many, many moons ago, um, I had a family member, uh, and they were, um, it was recommended that they uh, get a light therapy lamp. And at that particular point in time, you literally had to get a doctor's prescription to get one of these. And now there are a number of companies out there that sell them. You no longer need the doctor's prescription. So I think it's interesting sometimes how things change. The idea behind light therapy is that it uses different wavelengths. And so it's mimicking the natural light that a lot of times, especially this time of the year, we are not taking advantage of, or we don't have the opportunity to take advantage of. And the um, there's all sorts of data out there that talks about how these light waves um, that we lose a lot in the winter in particular can help improve energy. They lift it's our the moods. They, they reduce the, um, the symptoms of seasonal adjusted disorder. Okay. Um, little bit of a, um, a caveat here. Do your research on these um, beforehand. There are some issues where um, the different light waves that, it, that these things emit might uh, be not good for some individuals. And so um, read the small print if you're looking at some of these light therapy lamps out there. Uh, but overall, for most people, uh, these, these waves, these more natural waves have some very positive um, impacts. All right, so let's move now to the next slide, which is some, some simplified high tech that is out there. And on the left-hand side is the LEQ. And this is billed as a voice-operated care companion. And so some of the things, it's very simple. It's designed for seniors or people um, who struggle um, with instructions, which could be anybody of any age off, off um, it seems like. Um, so it's a friendly presence is kind of how they uh, describe it. And by voice command and simple on-screen instructions, I can interact with it and it will make productive suggestions to me throughout the day, like get up and move around, or have you called so-and-so, or, you know, what have you done you, you know, so it's got some built in sort of AI types of technology in there and um, has ways of encouraging me to stay healthy with my lifestyle to empower independence. And so some of those things, again, that I talked about that are strategies are sort of built into this device um, so that I have these. And so I'm just doing positive things throughout the day. Uh, very simple, very easy to use. It's set up, again, to be um, basically error free. 
and um, again, voice command. So it's good for folks that might have some mobility issues and not be able to um, operate other types of, of devices that are out there. So um, very nice, well-designed device, I think. On the right-hand side is a device called the GrandPad, which I believe we, we've touched on before. I just wanna make sure um, that I say a few words on this because this is designed for seniors. And sometimes people get a little confused. They're like, well, what's the difference between the grand pad and an iPad? Well, you know, for a lot of people who are not exactly technology savvy, getting an iPad is going to be difficult. They have to set up an iTunes account. They have to figure out how to download apps. They may not be comfortable with uh, utilizing apps. You know, there's a lot of little barriers that can get in the way of folks uh, using an iPad. So they've taken some of the benefits of the tablet devices, simplified it. They've designed it in a way that can keep uh, individuals safe. It's really geared towards seniors and there's no Wi-Fi connection. It's actually um, a 4G technology, I believe. And so it also has a number of features that are built in for individuals who have diminished eyesight, um, have motor skill issues, have hearing and cognitive issues as well. So it's a great way of helping somebody stay connected to family and friends, utilizing modern technology, but modern technology that's been scaled down, it's simpler to use, and it's safer for individuals to use. One thing um, that I wish was not the case, it can be a little expensive. There's a monthly subscription, which I think is around $65 a month. And so unfortunately, that may not be in everybody's budget, um, but this is a great tool, again, for seniors in particular to help them stay connected. All right, this next slide, we're gonna just slam right through this because this one went nowhere quick. I had some things in my notes that um, were social isolation, uh, ways of reducing social isolation during the pandemic in the post-pandemic world. Some people have changed focus. There was a great app out there um, in which I could connect with family and friends called House Party. There was another one called Bunch. I have just discovered in the last 24 hours that both of these companies have decided to discontinue um, these ways of virtually connecting people and playing games and exchanging uh, information and staying connected through this app. Now, on the plus side, um, something else that came out during the pandemic that was very positive for connecting people who may not physically be able to uh, be in each other's presence was Netflix Party. And so it was a way that virtually I could watch Netflix with friends, we could chat, we could exchange um, text, uh, chats, uh, verbal, or uh, stumbling all over that, that, where we can interact. That's the word I want to go for there. Well, Netflix Party was super great. It's still available, only it's gotten better. And now it's called Teleparty. And so not only can I do this, have this group of people share the experience of watching a movie on Netflix, it will also work with YouTube, it will work with Disney Plus, it will work with HBO. So this company has expanded it and there are more opportunities for me to watch something while I may not be able to physically be with other folks, I can join together and we can enjoy a sporting event like the World Cup that's going on right now. Um, so it might be something that we could, uh, that I could connect with family and friends over. Next slide, and this is just more of a reminder. Um, this too could be its own presentation somewhere down the road. And that is the idea of accessible gaming. And gaming is huge. People connect virtually, can, people connect in, in, in person around gaming. Uh, it is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States. They have done wonders in terms of making it accessible. And so we have done some work, um, as have others, around accessible gaming as a way of reducing social isolation. And um, there are any number of ways I can adapt. There are already adapted controllers I can buy off the shelf. And then if they needed further adaptations, various switches, alternatives to the mouse, zip and puff switches, et cetera, et cetera, can be set up with these devices so that everybody has equal access. Accessible gaming is also really good because um, it you do not know who the other people are. So all people are equal in accessible gaming, which I always think is kind of a fun little fact. All right, the last, I'll have to kind of quickly go through these last two slides. Volunteering, it's a great way to connect, but we may not all be able to um, go somewhere to volunteer or we may not want to. And I just wanted to throw a couple of ideas out here to encourage people to volunteer uh, in the world of disability. 
So Bookshare is a uh, organization that takes and their focus is on making books and other print materials into accessible formats. They are always looking for volunteers to read books and to do other things so they can put them in the library. So those individuals who start role with print text have access to them. Be My Eyes is sort of a... Um, um, a crowdsourced way of helping individuals with vision impairments be able to identify things in their environment. And so if I'm a sighted person, I can be a volunteer for Be My Eyes, and I can be connected with somebody through the app to um, help them identify or objects in their kitchen or in their environment, or maybe you help them read some print text. So it's kind of a fun way of being involved and doing something positive, but when I don't necessarily have to leave my home. Okay, so the last slide here before I hand it back over to Julie is there are, as we saw, a ton of apps out there that are designed around the idea of improving mental health, um, mindfulness, all these types of things that are related to the idea of tools that can reduce social isolation. It is really difficult to ferret out which ones of those are good, which ones of those are junk. And I'll confess there are a number of them out there that are less than stellar. Um, but and in the process of putting this together, I came across this resource on mental health apps um, put out by the ADAA. Um, which I have forgotten what that stands for, but the website there is on the bottom, uh, adaa.org. And if you dig around on the website, you can find these um, app reviews that they have put out where they have a series of ways that they look at the various apps to determine whether or not um, their uh, effectiveness um, and uh, the quality of them so that you are finding apps that are gonna be most beneficial to you and not wasting your time, which is incredibly important when we're talking about trying to find a tool to help me improve or maintain my mental health. So with that, Julie, I will hand it back to you. And thank you very much, everybody, for letting me share some of those devices with you. Thank you, David, that was awesome. Um, a couple of thoughts I had is one, I've done that with them when I've had a lot of anxiety um, in my life, I've done some of that clothing I didn't know they had a place for it but you know just wearing you know I think they used to call them Spanx I don't know what they're called now and then I just love some of the apps those will be very helpful so just real quick I just wanted to make sure we uh, we reached out and let you guys know that we have a, a some plans for next year uh, for our open door series and you will get all this information when when Angelina sends up the follow-up uh, you'll also get uh, a link to the video and then the the slides as well but we're doing some digital literacy and safety um, next month. And then the AT Academy, David's gonna do. So just to kind of keep that in mind that we've got, we've got more stuff coming next year in 2023. And then just a reminder, our website's always out there, lifecoursetools.com if you wanna start using any of the, the tools or just explore out there. And then last but not least, if you need anything or need more information, you can be, feel free to contact myself or David. So I really appreciate you guys all being here with us. Um, I know we are at time, so it was great to see you. And, and I hope everyone has um, a really nice holiday and a great new year. And we will we'll see you in 2023, which I love to say, see you next year. So see you next year and everyone take care. Thank you.